evening. My name is Charles Birchall. Um, a while ago I was asked if I would provide a workshop or some workshop material for Nature Manitoba on their evening series. One of the things that I thought I could do that uh, would really make sense to me and would really work for you is provide some information on some of my favorite paddling routes uh, throughout southern Manitoba, at least my day tripping routes, focusing primarily on easy paddling routes. Unfortunately, recently with COVID-19, um, the evening programs have been put on a little bit of a hold. Because I have material anyway already uh, developed, I thought I would give you a preview of the workshop that I was going to run through with the different routes. Here we go. Alright, so as I said, I wanted to look at some of my day tripping experiences, and the original uh, workshop really was going to be a very much of a discussion format and I found that works very well before but today I don't have that option so I'm going to go through some of the the day trips that I really enjoy and uh, give you the option to see what I've paddled. Most of these are within an hour or two of Winnipeg so that's where I live and I don't want to be driving all day so that's the limit and I've started with eastern Manitoba and then worked my way um, west through the province with different sites that I've enjoyed paddling. So the first site is the Masquaw River just near Pine Falls. This is a beautiful little river that has a number of small waterfalls, a number of small rapids, um, the portages are reasonably easy to make, although I have found that finding the portages sometimes has been a little bit difficult. I usually start on the highway, but uh, also calling in and, and parking at the Masquaw project it provides a, a really good alternative as well. So you can see the pictures here. And then on the, uh, the site that I've provided below, there is a video that takes you down the Masquaw River itself. The next place that I want to go is Coca-Cola Falls. And it's called this because of the, the peat staining in the water and the froth that you get uh, at the first set of falls. Again, a beautiful little creek that you put in right near Great Falls, paddle across the river. And I have found if the, the energy, if the station is actually running, there's a little bit of a current. So I make a wide berth around to get to the, the mouth of the creek and then paddle up the creek. One of the things I found out last year was if they're letting a lot of uh, water through the next uh, dam downstream, the water level can be low. And last year I wound up having a, the hike to Coca-Cola Falls rather than the paddle. But uh, normally it is a very pretty little paddle up to the falls and then a relatively easy portage up around the falls. And there's a, this is where the Trans-Canada Trail crosses over the, over the creek. But you can continue up beyond, and there's several more very beautiful uh, little waterfalls and very beautiful little sets of rapids, and it's a very pretty river in and of itself. And then to continue on, the Pinawa Channel. So this starts right near the town of Pinawa. You drive to the end of the highway, and there's an co old coffer dam that's there that leaks a little bit. And the really great thing about that is no matter what the water levels are like elsewhere in the province, this section of the, the river is really, or this section of the channel, really has the same amount of water all the way from May through October. So you're always assured of a, a very nice little paddle. It's one of my favorite places to go, especially if you stop at the old Pinawa Dam at the other end and explore around underneath the dam. Uh, there's a few little sets of rapids. Um, yeah, I do need to say that you have to be careful of the tubers during the summer, especially on warm weekend uh, days. They tend to come about out, out around 10 o'clock. Um, so if you go a little bit earlier, uh, you can have really have the channel all to yourself. It's the same thing if you go in the spring and the fall. Again, there is uh, a video that I've linked to below. This video is not mine. It's Steve Lambert's but I'm uh, linking to it because it gives you an idea of what the channel is like. If you like hiking, you can walk back up the Trans-Canada Trail to Pinawa and pick up your car and drive back if you want, or I often leave a bike at uh, the old Pinawa Dam. Next on the list 
is the tunnels. I think we all know the, the tunnels that are near Cavi Lake and the, the White Shell River. And it's a nice paddle, it's relatively easy. You should check with the park to make sure that the tunnel, especially the north tunnel, is open and paddleable. Uh, in the spring especially, or during high water, it can be a little bit low to get through. Uh, there are two tunnels that most people uh, know about, the ones from Cabby Lake to South Cross and South Cross to North Cross. But there is, if you head up Hanson's Creek, there is a third, fourth, and fifth tunnels as well that you can go through. Uh, really, the third one is the one that I, I really like, and it's in the middle of the screen right here. Uh, it's, these paddles are well worth it. Um, sometimes it's a little hard paddling upstream. Please remember to bring a whistle with you so when you enter the tunnels you let um, other users know that you're coming. The White Mouth River. So lots of people know the White Mouth River for like going to farmers or cooks um, and paddling in the, in the rapids there. But the piece that I really like is south of the Trans-Canada Highway. Uh, so you go to Hashville and you take the, the gravel road south until the old Dawson Road crossing. And from the old Dawson Road crossing back to the campground that's just south of uh, the, the number one highway, it's maybe a three or four hour um, ride, a little bit longer if the water's low, a little bit shorter if the water's high. It's a nice day paddle, uh, stop somewhere in the middle of, on one of the bluffs for lunch. Um, it is my favorite river. Um, I guess Penawa Channel is right up there as well. But I, I come out here often. One of the really great things is for years the, the group person that runs the campground is willing to give you a lift up to the old Dawson Road or maybe part way so you can paddle um, with one vehicle and you don't have to worry about car shuttling. That's really great. Uh, so that gives a, a really good opportunity. You can see some pictures here and I've provided some more links for videos of this section as well. The Broken Head River. So if you get a chance Pick up Dusty Molenski's book around the Broken Head River. It, this is a jewel um, for paddling on um, all the way from the Trans Canada Highway up through the, the Broken Head Reserve, and it has something for everyone. Uh, through the, the marshlands further south and the marshlands further north, it's a nice, easy river to paddle. And in the middle, there's lots of little rapids and riffles that you can paddle through. Um, lots of opportunities to explore. And like I said, Dusty's book is a really good introduction to uh, the river and places that you can put in and places that you can take out. I often put in uh, near Green Bay Bridge and for me I, I usually go upstream first almost as far as uh, Beaujager because then I can just float back. But there's lots of opportunities on the river and many many other places as well. So getting closer to home, some of you may actually know Cook's Creek from landing or paddling right in or near the, the town of East Selkirk, but you can actually put, put into Cook's Creek at Highway 44, just north of Birds Hill Park, and take that all the way down under Highway 59, um, and then stop at the, the old fire station. And there's a, a landing there, so it's easy to get in, out, in and out, there's parking there. Um, this is a really great little creek to paddle. One of the things that you really need to know though is you need to watch the water gauges because the creek is usually not deep enough to paddle at all and then if you get a heavy rain um, it comes up very quickly. So I watch it quite regular and if I've had a regular rain I look at the, the water gauge and I go okay it's ready to go and then I'm out there that day because usually by the next day or two uh, it started to drop again. But it is a, a wonderful little creek to paddle on um, when you get the chance. The rivers and creeks of Winnipeg. So Winnipeg has, uh, I'm going to include just south of Winnipeg, has uh, three rivers in it, um, but there's also several creeks. There's a Sturgeon Creek and Buns Creek um, that you can paddle, so there's lots of opportunities there. Uh, so the, may, the bigger rivers would be the Red River, of course, the LaSalle River, the Seine River, um, and the Assiniboine River. Did I say that already? And 
they provide lots of opportunities for paddling. I really like the, the Seine River, although by the end of the summer it's starting to get a little bit low. Uh, it's a good paddle, so if you think about paddling from Bowdery Park or even Headingley all the way downtown to the Forks, that's a really nice day trip. You can stop at a Cinnabon Park for ice cream, and then you can stop at the Forks for supper. Um, I usually give myself for that Headingley, the Forks run, maybe six, seven hours. If I'm putting in at just the perimeter highway, I'll give myself two, two and a half, three hours. Um, and again, it depends on the, the river level a little bit. It really provides a different way to look at the, the city from really some kind of wildernessy looking areas out through Charleswood to looking at what the downtown is like from another perspective. Going by uh, the part of the legislative buildings is really fun. The Seine River is a jewel. It is one of those things that you, you shouldn't miss um, all the way from uh, Prairie Grove all the way downtown to the Forks. It's about a 26 kilometer run so it takes a good portion of the day. Uh, there's beaver dams and deer and I've seen otters out there and ducks and uh, uh, turtles, uh, both of the little painted turtles as well as the big snappers. Lots of wildlife and it really gives you an idea of how you can be in the wilderness right inside the city. That being said, again, by the end of the summer, it's often getting a little shallow, so it's an early season uh, river to paddle. But lots of put-in places, lots of egress, egress places. The LaSalle River, so that uh, starts just south of St. Norbert and runs all the way through LaSalle and Sanford and all the way up to Eli if you want. Um, I paddle there quite often. With the dam that's at Liberia Park and the big riffles that are at each one of the towns, it keeps the water level relatively constant, so you're always, always assured throughout the summer that there's a place to paddle. The end that's closest to St. Norbert from Liberia Park to the, the monastery, often in the summertime, July, maybe in August, it gets starting to get a little shallow to paddle, but upstream from the park, upstream from Waverly, it's really a great place. It's not too much current, uh, very pretty. Uh, again, it gives you that wilderness river feel that's it's very close to home. So I'm going to go south a little bit. And the Roseau River is a play river, a river that lots of people that want to do some easy whitewater paddling uh, go out and paddle from Highway 59 to Highway uh, 218 and do the, the shuttle. I often put in or take out at uh, near the Sinkyu Bridge um, at the old Ford and it's got lots of little white water, lots of moving pieces. It's not really too technical or too difficult but I have to admit that every time I've been on the river it's been different. I've been on there when there's so much water that I didn't even know there's rapids and then I've been on there and you can see in some of the pictures here where there's lots of little very technical rapids when it's very shallow. So you lots of opportunities for different kinds of uh, experiences on the river. The Pemina River right down near Windy Gates, although if you follow the river up, back up through La Riviere and those areas, this is a beautiful river that's in a deep gorge. Um, I really like that section that is near the Pemina River Provincial Forest, uh, Provincial Park, sorry, uh, because it is Again, it has, gives you that wilderness experience, that, that peace that's out there. It's, you're starting to get into quite a deep gorge, so it's very scenic and very pretty to paddle on. Um, you'll see here that there's some little moving bits of water. Again, like a lot of these uh, prairie rivers, that later in the summer it's a little bit iffy. Most of the rivers have got water gauges on them, so I watch the water gauges all the time. And if the, the water comes up to the right level, I make my choice. Really, the only one that, that you can be assured that's going to be constant is the Pinawa Channel. Um, and then the bigger rivers, of course, that uh, like the, the Red River, um, always has lots of water for paddling. Moving a little bit west, so Cypress River, some of you may have driven down Highway 2 and driven uh, across the Cypress River and you go, river? Uh, there's no river here. It might be a ditch or a creek or something like that. Again, this is one of those things that, kind of like Cook's Creek, that 
when it rains really hard or in the spring, the water will come up very quickly. And from Highway 2 all the way to the Cinnabon, right next to the Sandylands Provincial Park that, sorry, did I say Sandylands? Uh, Spruce Woods Provincial Park. Um, it becomes a river that you can actually paddle. Uh, there's a fair bit of current when, there's wa when it's deep enough to use, so it's really a one-way trip. But it is a phenomenal little paddle, uh, very scenic, very beautiful. You do need to be careful because there are uh, barbed wire fences that are strung across, and there are a number of places where there are essentially um, uh, low head dams, uh, uh, either roads or other things that go across that can cause uh, dangerous currents. Um, I was out there last spring, and one of the, the roads with culverts had whirlpools at one end, so you really need to be careful of that. But uh, it's kind of a cool thing to do to, to paddle these little rivers. Um, as long as you're wary of the, the conditions and, like I said, fences and, and these low head dam kinds of things. The Suris River. So the Suris River, um, I've paddled it between Highway 10 and Wallanisa. Um, this is a great, it's in a deep river valley. It has lots of little relatively easy moving sections. Um, it's very scenic. There's a, a number of places to get it in and out um, if you want. It is well worth the time. Again, it winds up being uh, an earlier season river to paddle because by the time you get into mm, July, August, that, that the water levels have usually dropped too much for, for doing anything comfortable for paddling. I do Some of the cliffs, some of the sand cliffs are just phenomenal to, to look at. And it worried me the first time that I was paddling on it that what would happen if one of those sand cliffs decided to give away when I was paddling right, right below it. And just uh, upstream of uh, McKellar's Bridge, two years ago I think, one of those sand cliffs did give away. And I'm kind of glad I wasn't there when it happened because it would have been a, a frightening experience. But they are very, very cool, uh, these cliffs to see and paddle below. And we keep going west, and this is about as far as I ever want to go for a day trip. Um, for me, this is the Little Saskatchewan River. It's right, at least the section that, I, that I've paddled is right near Brandon. Um, and it's a very popular river, again, just like the, um, the Penawa Channel. It's very popular for tubing, but uh, if you get there early enough in the morning, it is quite a fun little jaunt. Um, this, again, you need to look at the water gauge because it can be almost low and not worth paddling um, to at some points where there's the old hydro dam and there's riprap and other, other structures, uh, the current can actually be quite dangerous. So it's one of those things that you still need to watch the water levels and, and what it looks like. So those are the, the rivers that I wanted to give you some experience of. Manitoba has hundreds of places to paddle lakes and other rivers and in further in the north and uh, other places in the south I couldn't go through them all so I just needed to pick some out to uh, to give you an idea of where I like to go at least for day tripping um, but there are lots of other places as well and as I said I've left some material down below for reference uh, information and throughout the video I've, I've left some places where you can link out uh, one of the things that in the presentation or in the workshop that I was going to give, I wanted to talk a little bit more about where you can get information, water levels, uh, some of that information is below. Um, I want to talk about how to deal with car shuttles. It is most embarrassing that if you're running a car shuttle, you get everybody sorted out, you go back, you get all your cars, you get everybody back to their original cars, you start to drive off and then you realize you forgot a canoe or forgot somebody at the uh, takeout point. So that communication piece. Um, one of those pieces that you really need to be careful of is the time commitments that are, are required. So I think of the, the Francis Lake paddle. So it's, it wasn't in my presentation, but the paddling time from uh, where you can put in, uh, from the, the put in up to Francis Lake, there's a nice sign there that says it's five or six hours. Oddly enough, I've done that the whole round trip in about six hours, but sometimes that little that little piece 
has lots of beaver dams and it can take an awful long time to get across all of those. So be really uh, aware of the time that's required to, to paddle some of these sections. Ask, contact uh, myself or other people that have done it before to see, and make sure that the skill level that you're going on actually matches the skill level of the, the people that are going with you. Um, even the Pinawa Channel, which is relatively straightforward, there's a little riffle right in the middle that, that is either kind of fun or kind of scary. There's a little portage around it. So gauge the people that you're going with. Um, I mentioned water gauges, and they're, for me, they're a super useful piece to go to the water gauges and find out what the water levels are like so I know what's safe and what's not safe. If you're leading a trip, always have your first aid kit with you. Always have some form of communication. Cross most of southern Manitoba. Cell phones do work, but not everywhere. Um, the Pemina Valley, some places the White Mouth River, some places in the Broken Head, you get spotty reception. Some places in the Roseau, spotty reception. Um, so be aware of that. Uh, first aid I just mentioned, I always carry a bailout bag with me, which contains um, repair stuff, uh, communications, uh, hydration, um, uh, repair equipment, those kinds of things. So I always take that with me. I mentioned communication. And then finally, always, always have a float plan with you. Who's going with you, where you're going, how many people are there, what time you expect to be out. Um, and I often include things like if I've got tarps with me and canoes with me, the colors of those things. So if, if you are delayed and they send somebody out to find you, they'll be able to spot you um, by the colors that you're putting up. Leave that float plan with somebody responsible. Anyway, thank you very much. And really, that's what the presentation was going to be about. Of course, when I'm doing this in person, it gives you a chance to ask lots of questions. And I'm just speaking to you through the camera right now. But uh, I hope it's giving you some ideas of where to paddle. The resources are there. Thank you, and uh, I hope to see you on the, the rivers and lakes this summer.